Anybody know? What? The length of your foot. <laughs> You've got an awfully long foot. If you, uh, you know. It has actually, in a way, it's related. It comes from the pace. The pace. The word mile. The word mile comes from the Latin mil, as in millimeter, milligram. What does it mean? What does mil mean in Latin? Thousand. thousand. Yeah, good. So a thousand paces is what, where we get the mile from. So there was a Roman mile, and the Roman mile was somewhat shorter than the any British mile, which is the one we still use here in America. The one we use here in America, if you think about it, take the number of feet in a mile, which is how many? 5, Good, 5,280. You divide that by 1,000, and you get 5.28. 5.28, then, was the average length of the human pace that was 1,000 of which gave us the mile. <clears throat> and Again, I don't think we'll have time to get into that tonight, but I've got a whole program where I show the origins of these ancient systems of measurement, and we can see that the mile was almost certainly being used in England 3,000, 4,000 years ago. It's at least that old. For example, the outer rim of the stone circle at Stonehenge is 105.6 feet. Go 105 Point six and multiply by five. Five hundred and twenty eight feet, right? So in other words, one tenth of a mile. The the outer diameter of the Sarsen Stone Ring of Stonehenge is precisely one tenth of a mile. So we can find examples like that, and from those examples we can know that these people were using assist a unit of measurement that long ago, perhaps the builders of Stonehenge using a unit of measurement that we're still using today. That's very interesting. And see, w this brings us to another uh, discussion that we, w we won't g get off on that tangent tonight, but it's the discussion of the, you know, the traditional system versus the metric system. And, you know, the efforts on the scientific community, which, I, of course, I, I do believe that there is, I, I certainly understand the arguments of the scientific community in, in favor of the metric system because it's all decimal. However, by abandoning the traditional system, we're going to lose something very profound, which is the, the, the connection of our archaic units of measurement with the determination of the structure and patterns of the cosmos because that's where it ultimately all derives from. We'll be seeing some of that. So let's get on with some of the slides. Um, let, before we go on into the slides, let's do this. Let's do this. We have diurnal rotation on its axis. Now, we know that that happens. Of the second motion, we talk rotation is the orbiting of a system or the, 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 revo the, the turning of a system about a point internal. That's what we call rotation. The, the turning about a point external is called a revolution. So we're talking about a planet that rotates on its axis but revolves about the sun. So rotation on its axis gives us the day. The revolution about the sun gives us the year. We know that one revolution around the sun, back to the same starting position, the Earth has not turned an even number of times, has it? It's turned 365 and roughly one quarter times around. Well, it's interesting that if you begin studying the ancient calendars, from all over the world we find something very consistent happening. The belief that the year was once 360 days long. The Sumerians, in fact, who are generally attributed with the origin of the what we call the sexagesimal division of a circle, were the ones who originated the 360 degrees in a circle, 360 degrees, and their belief was that at some unnamed point in the distant past, the length of the year was greater the way I look at that is I, I don't necessarily think we have to take that as being literally true because when one begins to study these arcane traditions and the sacred traditions, what you begin to realize, for example, like sacred geometry, that basically shows us there is a, a pattern to all things, whether it's spatial relations or temporal relations, sacred geometry teaches that there's a, uni a set of unifying patterns that links all of this together. And so um, <clears throat> what happens is that we begin to see these patterns unfolding on a one level, on a human level. By seeing those patterns on the, the micro scale, we can understand those patterns on the larger scale, which are reflections of the smaller ones. 
So we have a relationship, a basic relationship, 360 to 1. We'll call that, in fact, some of the ancient cultures actually ran two calendars. They had their secular calendar or their civil calendar. They also had their sacred calendar. The civil calendar would mark the actual year, the imperfect year. The sacred calendar would mark the perfect year of 360 days. So then, if you think about the orbit of the Earth around the Sun turning 360 times on its axis precisely, now that defines that circle, the cosmic circle, divided into exactly 360 degrees. And you have a one-to-one -one correlation. The way I perceive it essentially is that behind all manifest creation there is a divine pattern. Being a builder, I think in terms of blueprints. And I know that when you sit down, when you go out to do a, a building project, you have a set of blueprints, and you work from those blueprints, and the objective is to duplicate those blueprints, those plans, as close as possible. And of course, the higher the degree of craftsmanship, the, the closer is your approximation going to be to the, the idealized plans that are on the paper, right? You build it, there's going to be some measure of imperfection that finds its way in no matter how good of a craftsman you are. And then, of course, over time, you know, the vagaries of, of time are going to wear on the, the structure. And over time, it's going to begin to deviate more and more, slightly at first, and then at an accelerating pace, it's going to deviate from the idealized pattern. Well, when you study sacred geometry, you realize that you, you see that what you're actually studying is, is the idealized, the teleological pattern behind all of manifested creation. That's the first step, is to understand that pattern. Then the, from there, you can then begin to see, oh yes, okay, I can see how the orbit of Jupiter almost hits it. I can see how the, 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 the mass of the planets almost hit it. Some of them will hit it exactly on, others will deviate a little more or less. The same idea with the golden section and the measure of the, of the human anatomy. We discovered that the, how many of you have heard of the golden section? Yeah, the golden section, also known as the, the, the um, divine proportion. It's got, a, it's got 50 different names. And you know, it's the governing proportion of the human body. And you find it in your elbow to fingertip dimension, your cubit, right? If you find that space in your wrist, that hole right there, you'll feel there's a hole in the top of your wrist. And that hole divides your cubit, elbow to fingertip, in this sacred proportion that says the small stands to the large unit as that does to the whole cubit. Small to large as large is to whole. That is the essentially the governing ratio for the human form. It's also found throughout all orders of nature. It was utilized by artists, architects, musicians. I know various composers like Bartok were very much into, um, you know, composing pieces that, that, that incorporated those particular ratios. Um, likewise with the patterns of sacred geometry. Um, if you start looking throughout the natural world, you can begin to find very close approximations of many of these relationships. If you look at the the human world of art and architecture and so forth, you can begin to find those. What we're going to be talking to tonight, though, is primarily having to do with the these, psycho, uh, th these patterns and proportions as they relate to the passage of time. And here we have to understand that the archaic view of the passage of time was cyclical. It wasn't linear. It was cyclical. And so we, of course, conceive of cycles. When we talk about this, we're talking about a cycle. When we talk about this, we're talking about a cycle. And clearly, the day-night cycle governs all aspects of our lives. The yearly cycle governs all aspects of our lives. Less, say, less now than for our ancestors, but for more prim quote-unquote primitive cultures around the planet, it's still, are, they're totally integrated with the natural cycles. That is part of our loss, is that we have become disconnected to the point where you know we're not even hardly aware of the sky anymore. I mean, particularly living in an urban area, people don't know how to recognize the star patterns anymore. Um, the plane of the ecliptic, or the celestial equator, or the the the, um, the celestial pole. All of these things that ancient peoples, whether they understood it in a scientific sense or not, they certainly understood it in the personal sense.